On the streets of Sao Paulo, they greet her like a film star, though the only dream she's selling is of a better city. She's 55, a mother of three, a professional psychoanalyst, and a 21st century mayor. My city has lived 10 years of abandon, corruption, and I thought I could help. I could be a fresh new thing there that could help mainly the people excluded from everything that we have in the city. Marta used to give advice about sex on Brazilian TV, but she's also a politician. And last October, on a wave of goodwill, she was elected mayor of Sao Paulo, the world's fourth largest city. Do you share the nightmarish vision that many people have of the great science fiction megacity of the 21st century? We have that already. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have nightmares on the future. I have nightmares on the present. <laughs> the challenge is exactly to change that. Sao Paulo, the city Marta runs, where over 10 million people live their own dreams and nightmares. This summer, Marta and politicians from across the world will meet to review progress since the United Nations City Summit five years ago. Their theme, and ours in this series of life, how to run the cities of the 21st century. The cities where in the next 10 years, most people in the planet will live. If you look at uh, the last 400 years, what has happened, you know, we, we started with empires, mostly in the 19th century. We came to the nation states of the 20th century. And believe me, through globalization now, we are entering, this is a century of cities. It is a trend which cannot be stopped. It is an economic trend, it is just a matter of time. And uh, all projections now show that people are marching onto cities, even in the developing countries. And the challenge, therefore, facing, the, uh, facing us in this century is how to make cities a better place for, for the majority of the people. There are winners and losers in the globalized economy, and Sao Paulo is a winner. Its stock exchange brings in capital from across the world. It has a big stake in the knowledge economy. It's a city of the educated, the professionals who work downtown. I like it very much. It's a very nice city. I find that's a very good city to be living because you have everything you want to do here. The city is wonderful. I like the culture in Sao Paulo. I like Sao Paulo. There's a lot. There's work here. This Sao Paulo could be any great global metropolis. London, New York, Tokyo. And just like any world city, prosperous new elites are remaking whole neighborhoods in their own image. It's been called the Glamour Zone. The urban Glamour Zone has fine restaurants, state-of-the-art office buildings, state-of-the-art residences. It has it all, beautiful streets, private security, world-class culture. Outsiders can traverse it. It's a space that can be consumed as an experience, as an afternoon's event, etc. I would say the defining mark is the ascendance of design. You have the design lab, design food, design people. You know, they go to the health clubs there. <laughs> Perfect shape. Glamour zone is for a minority, but it is enormously important. About 20% in Sao Paulo, in Bangkok, in Bombay. So it is very different from the old rich. We've always had, you know, their space in the city. This is the high-profile Sao Paulo that's prospering in the global economy. Down on the streets, though, easy to forget the more lowly paid workers making their own contribution to the city's service industries. If you take the financial industry, it's highly globalized, but it needs cleaners, 
It needs all kinds of low-wage service workers. It needs truckers to drop off the software and the toilet paper. You know, they also need that. There is a whole set of jobs, types of workers, types of firms that are part of the globalized sectors in these cities, but they don't look like it. They're not recognized as such. They are not, you know, valued as such. Isn't there a danger in the 21st century that the elites of the big cities of the world um, have more in common with each other. The lawyer in New York has more in common with the lawyer in Sao Paulo and Paris than the lawyer in Sao Paulo does with the, the own workers, the people who wash his car and that make happened. his meals. That happens. That happens. It's already happening for so many times. What can you the do The challenge about that? is to change that. But there are others who don't have any stake in the global economy at all. Those who can't even find jobs as clerks or cleaners, who've fallen on hard times or drifted into crime. Over half a million Paulistas live in so-called beehives, only a few blocks from the glamour zone. The crowded tenements of the excluded. The most important thing, I think, which makes people excluded in cities is the sense of isolation in the midst of all this. It's such a contradiction that you're in the midst of this huge mega city. You're part of it and yet you're excluded from it. And I think that's the real crisis today in, in all cities. It's uh, citizenship is not universal. It's like we and they. And the poor are they. And there's confusion about whether they're citizens. These are the people who live where the railway doesn't work anymore, where they seem like refugees in their own country. These are the slums people drive past or drive over on their way downtown. The worst of these mean and murderous streets have been called the war zone. An urban war zone for me is a part of the city that has been neglected in terms of investments, that has been neglected in terms of basic public services, such as garbage collection, uh, uh, renewing the pavement of the, on the streets, etc. I mean, very elementary things. It's a zone where you have a sense of a surplus population. You have a sense of who needs these people and also a sense that they have been robbed of something so that it, they cannot even invent their own project as to why they are there. We're talking about something very bad. Today, Marta, the people's mayor, has come to the war zone. She wants to do something about poverty, the inequalities that go with globalization. But what most people care about right now is not so much social justice as basic services, like the state of the streets. The difficulty with any mega city is, is the twin dilemmas of, of attempting to deal with providing basic services and attempting to deal with the massive amount of poverty that plagues so many of, of the mega cities of the world. So at one point, you know, on one hand, the mayor of Sao Paulo has to focus on providing basic services, has to focus on primarily safety but also public transportation, clean streets, clean water, key, uh, key services. At the same time, there's a, you know, sort of a massive uh, human desire to actually right the wrongs of, of the world as, as embodied by uh, the thousands, and in Sao Paulo's case, millions of uh, disadvantaged youths who are growing up there. And uh, I think the greatest challenge facing a, a leader of the city is, is how do you balance those two, those two needs. What's brought the millions of disadvantaged to cities like Sao Paulo is rural poverty and the elusive promise of urban prosperity. They've just turned up and built shacks here on the edge of the city. Normally what happens in these large growing mega cities of the developing countries, people, uh, there is a, a high rise of sp what we call spontaneous settlements. Some people popularly known as slums, but slums are nothing but spontaneous settlements. People come, they need a place to sleep, you know, there is no flat to, to which they can get. If there is a flat, they don't have rent, they can't pay rent, so they put up their own, you know, little place to stay, normally by squatting on, on land. 
Over 400,000 families in Sao Paulo lack what the city authorities call even minimally decent housing. In neighborhoods like Guananazes, Sao Paulo has built better homes. But the new housing meant altering the flow of the river. And the altered river flooded the homes of those who hadn't been chosen to live in the new houses. When the flood happened, everything inside the house was ruined. We and the kids were inside and we had to climb over the walls. There was a flood on Friday and again on Sunday. On Sunday we had time to run outside but everything was flooded again. And now the house is cracking up. Scenes like this in a relatively prosperous country lead some to argue decent housing should be a human right. The world, I think, is rich enough today, internationally, globally, to provide decent housing as well as decent food and decent health care to everyone on the planet. I think the resources are there. The question is how they are used. And the idea that it should be the right of the citizen of any civilized country to have a standard of housing that's commensurate with maintaining a decent health, maintaining the possibilities of getting ahead in, in life, I think that possibility is there and ought to be recognized everywhere. Out here in the illegal city are whole neighborhoods that lack not just decent housing, but most basic services. Often they're beyond the reach of the law and of government. Last year we filmed with the Posse, a group of young people trying to organize some of the services middle-class neighborhoods expect the city to provide. Most of the posse are in their 20s, here in the illegal suburbs, that's old. People who come to the city, they have for the last decade been living in the borders of the city. And this place, we, we found out probably about 11 regions of the city that don't have any presence of uh, government. And these regions are the regions that have growth Grew, grew more, like 100% in 10 years. And half of the population has uh, less than 18 years old. The posse have their own rap band. They sing about young criminals and young victims. Easy to find in a city that can see 50 murders in a weekend. When people are astonished of the kind of violence we are, going, we are having in a big city like Sao Paulo, I'm not astonished. If you have half of the population in these poor sections that are less than, have less than 18 years old, and they have no access on education, no perspective, perspective, and they cannot see a light in the tunnel. No prospects. No, their prospects are uh, nothing. How come you think they are not going to be violent or delinquent? Posse member Du has been coming downtown to the Glamour Zone to work. He's sad but not surprised that others come here to rob. If we had a fair distribution of wealth, the kids from the suburbs wouldn't come downtown to steal a few dollars. Dues as keen as anyone, the new mayor makes Sao Paulo safe. One thing that can be done, uh, talking specifically about Sao Paulo, which is a local phenomenon, is very important for the welfare of the poor, is actually providing safe streets. And you say it's sort of a basic service, but if you think about you know, what are sort of basic rights that we think kids are entitled to, security of property rights, security of life is really way up there. And if we think about the things that actually are barriers to investing in skills, 
having unsafe streets, having a flourishing drug trade that distracts you from actually going to school is a tremendous handicap that poor people face. Solving the problems of local crime are absolutely mayor's responsibilities. For the young people in the suburbs, education is more than a basic need. It's a vital priority if they're to have any chance of a stake in the global economy. But despite the good work in the Posse's local school, one out of three Paulistas have trouble reading and writing. The teacher's boss knows their city has to do better. Sao Paulo is a, is a such an important city in Latin America that we have to have qualified people you know, for service because it was an industrial city at the beginning of the century. Now it's more and more a service city. In order to have service city, you have to have uh, very qualified people. And we still don't have as many as we need. So the biggest challenge to make Sao Paulo globalize in a good sense for opportunity for the citizens of Sao Paulo, we have to have education. And that's uh, something that I put a big effort to acquire. But kids can't study if they're sick. The clinic in San Miguel treats age-old problems and the special illnesses of the city. I know a lot of babies and two and three years old kids and older ones suffering respiratory problems because of the pollution. Hospitals of Sao Paulo, they are the best of the country. But uh, at the same time, uh, the pollution of the air and the quality of life that's very stressing, all that, that makes it more, that makes it worse for health. No? Infectious waterborne diseases are another big city health hazard. This morning, they're checking vaccination cards providing the basic services that can prevent illness is another of the new mayor's priorities. The most fundamental issue of, say, health uh, requires that certain basic essentials are provided to the whole city. You need to create access to clean water for everybody. You have to get rid of everybody's solid waste. You have to clean garbage. You can't say, I'll only clean garbage here and not here, because the flies don't know the boundaries. So things like that have to be planned for the whole city. Marta knows that for many women in Sao Paulo, domestic violence is also a serious health issue. Today, she's visiting a shelter that helps battered women. Men have abused the women here. The city has helped them. This house for me is like a mother, and I would like to pass it on to all women. In this house, I was reborn and educated for another life. Today, I'm a new woman, thanks to the professionals working in this shelter. Because violence is very great here, and there are very few places where a woman can go for help, physical help and psychological counseling. Many times, a woman is spanked and she doesn't go for help and knowing that a place like that exists that will help her to come. The success of the shelter and of the woman who's visiting are signs that even macho cities like Sao Paulo can become places of opportunity for women. The space of the city is actually enabling women and this represents a radical departure from a very common image that the space of the city is dangerous for women. Remember that, I mean, Novels from the 1800s already were full of that. And I think that what the last 20 years are showing, especially the last 10 years, is that the, the space of the city begins to enable women and they can emerge as political subjects in a way that they did not 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and that they do not still, I think, in small towns and in suburbs. The, the 21st century is ours, no doubt. <laughs> I don't think even in a machista country like Brazil, being a woman today, uh, it's, a, it's something that goes against you. 
at least for me, it has helped several times. Because I think people think women are more honest. Uh, and also they respect women in the sense of uh, dealing with money. But cities are built for men, aren't they? Built by men for men. That's true, but poverty, uh, who deals most with poverty, are women. But back in poverty-stricken Guananazes, they remember how the council's well-intentioned schemes cause so much damage. Here, even the women are cynical about their new mayor's promises. To be quite honest, I don't believe any of it anymore because every time a new government starts, they make a lot of promises. First, there was Malou. He promised a lot but never delivered. Then there was Pita. And now it's Marta. It's only the beginning for her, but I don't believe it anymore. Here in Brazil, it's all just plans and promises. I don't feel like a citizen of Sao Paulo. I feel like an animal, an animal that nobody feels sorry for. The government, mayor, the local politicians, they never come around unless it's election time. They're just worried about our votes. With cynicism so ingrained, the new mayor of Sao Paulo may need all the encouragement she can get from the colleagues and experts she'll meet at the UN's Conference on Cities this summer. What do you think of the biggest challenge confronting someone starting to run a city like Sao Paulo? Mm. Well, I think that the a biggest challenge will first of all to, to, to reach out with the, with, the, with the stakeholders of Sao Paulo, who are the people of Sao Paulo. I am sure you have the financial magnates of Sao Paulo, you have the industrialists of Sao Paulo, but you also have the poor of Sao Paulo, the homeless. So my message, my advice, my humble advice, if I could, would be that, first of all, to get to know the people and to listen to them. What are they saying? Because you see, the, the, the poor of the cities, they are not just uh, passive objects. Most often, they are solving their own problems. These people are taking care of themselves, actually. They are putting up, as I said, their own spontaneous settlements. They are taking care of their living environment. So if you listen, I think uh, uh, what, that's why I'm talking about participatory governance. That if the mayor of Sao Paulo, I, I believe, if he or she would sit down with the constituents and listen, most of the problems will be solved by the people themselves. They are the key. The people of Sao Paulo are the key to the problems of Sao Paulo. I think everybody has a right to hope. And I think most people who come into cities come to, to transform the lives of their children, if not for themselves. And in most cases, if you talk to even the poorest person who lives in the city, they will tell you that 10 years of living in the city has transformed the choices for their children, even if there are many more steps to go. So I think whether you're rich or you're poor, cities provide you that opportunity. And everybody has a right to explore that option. So do you look to these great sprawling cities as being a, a, a nightmare or, or, a, or, or symbols of hope? Definitely symbols of hope. I certainly don't think you should despair. I think Sao Paulo does have a huge amount of promise, absolutely. There are some cities, and I would classify Sao Paulo as one of them, that basically exist for sound economic principles. It doesn't mean that the poverty that these megacities have brought to light isn't distressing. It doesn't mean that we don't need to don't need to address that. But putting a halt to its growth is not the right answer. The right answer is a national policy to lift the poor everywhere, not to block the movement of the poor to the employment opportunities of Sao Paulo. I think Sao Paulo is a wonderful city. I think it's got a range of opportunities, a range of offerings, a, a variety, a diversity that is that is very rich and that can be, can, it can be a wonderful place and is for many people a wonderful place to live. And that can be true in other 21st centuries cities yes. too? Yes, I think so. In the Parisopolis favela, school kids try and persuade their neighbors to recycle plastic bags. Their new mayor's hope is she can harness the spirit of these children and turn the residents of the glamour zone, the war zone, and the illegal city into residents of one community. Something unique has happened in my city. The city was in such a state of corruption and abandon that 
people from all social levels are giving their hands and saying, we want to help. You can see that in a janitor, you can see that in the big the entrepreneur. So if I do right and I can, if I articulate right all these people, all this effort, all this emotion that can go as far as that, I think we can make a difference in the city. Even with all the limits we have, if we have a competent administration, honest administration that really cares for the people, we can do it. Marta has four years to make a difference before she faces re-election. In this series of life, we'll be looking at the challenges which face the world's other cities, big and small, and the three billion people who live in them. <laughs>